went to trial, went to jail, and he, he was acquitted. And Stanford apparently paid for his, uh, paid for his uh, legal costs. Again, that's a bit murky as to whether he did or didn't, but it appears that he did. Uh, so that was that, and, and he had to reinvent himself after that. And uh, then he went, uh, he, when the whole trial thing uh, was over, uh, Flora died actually just at the same time uh, when he was on trial. And the son, uh, sadly, uh, uh, just to think of the son's name in a minute, but his, he, he, he was uh, committed to a, an orphanage for, for 20 years. And again, I think he, he came into, into Moorbridge's life later on. But, uh, it was, a, it was a very sort of tragic thing. So I, I, he went off to Central America then, and this is where I have an interest in him because he took some photographs of coffee plantations and the world of coffee, and there's some, there's some beautiful photography that I've seen from uh, sources of our origin in places like Panama. Um, and uh, he took these wonderful pictures of, of people working in, in, in the coffee business. He then invented the, uh, if I pronounce this right, the zoo. Zupratt scope, um, which effectively was this circular thing that took pictures. Uh, it was almost like uh, an early camera that you're going to be talking about, but because it, it showed the frames in quick succession and there was a handle on it. And uh, what else do we have about him? Uh, so we told you, he then went to Philadelphia and spent a lot of time working uh, with the university there. And again, there was a dispute. He, he seemed to lurch from sort of crisis to crisis in terms of funding his, his various endeavours. And, and again, this would, be, this would be something a lot of artists would struggle for. They're trying to get funding. But he was clever enough because he aligned himself with, first of all, the government, then uh, Stanford, and then uh, the University of Philadelphia. And, and he ended up falling out with them all. But, you know, he, he, everybody had, he, he, he also seemed to every couple of years change his agent and be moving office and you know it all seemed to be all very uh, Florido uh, was the name of his son, sorry, I couldn't, just couldn't make it for a long time. He also, in the early days, he, 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 he traded under a pseudonym, like he changed his name about three or four times and he traded under the name, uh, the pseudonym of Helios, where he produced some of his early work in, uh, in San Francisco. Um, he also uh, was here in Dublin actually, in, uh, in 1890, and he, he made a, a presentation to the RDS Society and also to the Institute of uh, Photography on Great Brunswick Street. So, from what I can see, he was only here for a weekend, and I'm sure there's probably something written about it. I couldn't find anything, but he was here in Dublin, so we have a, we have a connection with him. And he, um, he started his life in England, and he finished his life in England. He went back to England in the, in the, early, the late 1880s, and he lived out his final years back in, uh, in Kingston, Kingston-on-Thames. And one of the things he did before he died was he, uh, he had a replica of the Great Lakes built in his garden. Um, again, this was the sort of stuff he did. It was, uh, so he had all these series of small ponds that were uh, replicated on, on, on the Great Lakes. So he, he was truly a, 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 a fascinating character. He was eccentric. Uh, apparently, if, if, if ever, anybody ever spelt his name Edward, as is in the tra traditional way of spelling it, he, he would write them a legal letter. He was quite, uh, <laughs> he, he was quite vain. He was quite difficult, and he was quite cantankerous. And he, he looked a bit like Santa Claus. He had a big long beard, long hair. He was very unkempt looking, and, and he was a, a true character. So I was, I was fascinated to read about him, to learn about him, and to, to see the contribution he's made, uh, his early contribution to, to photography is actually, it's absolutely undisputed. Um, so that was my bit of homework, so I've told you what I know about Moybridge now, and I just want to sort of finish off by saying that uh, I think that the worlds of business and art should they should be coming more together. And I think that if, if, if and I'm not saying that I'm a, a philanthropist or anything like that, because I'm not, but if I, can, if I can help in the world of art in some way by my experience in business, um, I'm happy to do that, and that's something which I've been doing for a while. But you've got people like, you know, 
Bill Gates, Dennis O'Brien, these are all people who, who are interested in the arts. And I think the trick with, 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 from, from the artist's perspective is to get these people's attention and to get them, to get them interested in your art and in your craft. And I, and I think that's where the likes of Moybridge was clever. Um, he, 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 he was able to you know, take really, really good photographs of a guy's house that made him feel good. And then all of a sudden he was able to work with him in all these other areas. So that's my small take on Edward Moybridge and the world of photography. So thank you for listening to me.